Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to your summer research seminar series. For those that are joining for the first time, my name is Vicki Bowden. I am a project manager here in HOP. And today we have um, Dr. Guillem Argilis Martinez that will be talking about immunology and cancer. Before we begin, I'd like to share some reminders with you all. Um, any questions that you may have during the seminar, please submit them via our Q&A feature. If there are questions that um, we are unable to address, you can submit them using the Google form that we will be emailing and Dr. Martinez will answer them afterwards. And after the session today, you'll be emailed a feedback survey. We ask all to um, fill out the survey as it will help us gauge your experience and implement any changes for future seminars. If you've missed any past seminar recording, um, seminars recordings are available on our YouTube page, HOP Summer Student Program. We ask that you visit that, that page to view past seminars. And again, today we have Dr. Um, Guillermo Agiles Martinez, and he is a senior visiting investigator at the Luis Diaz Lab here at MSKCC. Um, and he's been here since March of this year. Prior to this position, he formed part of the Gastrointestinal Malignancies Division at the Val de Bon University Hospital in Barcelona, Spain. And he was there from 2014 to 2020. Dr. Agilis began the early steps of his career focused on translational research by obtaining his medical oncology specialization in 2011 under the supervision of Jose Basalga at the Val de Bon University Hospital in 2011. Dr. Agilis joined the phase one and developmental therapeutics division of this institution for a fellowship stage in molecular therapeutics. During this period, he had the opportunity to be involved in the preclinical and early clinical studies that set the basis for further clinical development of some of the main molecularly driven drugs currently emerging in clinical practice. Um, Dr. Agilis' career path seeks to expand the therapeutic universe of metastatic colorectal cancer by improving the acknowledgement of the biological processes behind these tumors. In this regard, he is currently involved in several translational lines of investigation, like the development of new preclinical models that allow fast and reliable bedside to bench and back to the bedside strategies for tailoring therapeutic strategies in colorectal cancer. Again, thank you all for joining and we welcome Dr. Argilis. Thank you very much, Vicky, for this nice introduction. Okay. So uh, after this nice introduction, uh, I'm going to start talking about immunology and cancer. So uh, I structured the talk. Uh, the talk is going to be didactic. It's uh, designed, intended to be didactic. So uh, we're going to start with a very basic, basic concept, and then we are going to progressively increase in, in, in complexity just to avoid leaving uh, someone behind. So I'm going to start discussing about the general concept of the immune system cancer interplay, how these two compartments uh, are relate one to the other in a cancer patient and how we can use this interplay in our favor when it comes to cancer therapeutics. Then we are going to discuss the immune mechanisms of cancer surveillance, the tumor mechanisms of immune evasion, and then we are going to uh, go through a introduction to current panorama of cancer immunotherapy before getting in the questions and answers. I will be talking around 45 minutes before the questions. So let's just start with the immune system cancer interplay. So what is the immune system? So the immune system, in, immune came from immunis, from Latin, which, it, which means exempt. So the immune system is an integrated system of, of organs, tissue cells, and, and uh, different substances specialized in differentiate the self from the non-self and neutralize potential harmful, harmful non-self entities. So for that, there are two concepts I want to introduce before getting into the talk, which is what is self and what is non-self, and what is immune tolerance and what is immune rejection. So, um, so uh, there are the immune system is specialized in, in recognizing the non-self uh, uh, microorganisms or entities, mainly bacteria, toxins, allergens, parasites, virus, and foreign cells. And uh, the immune system is very good in doing this job. 
However, when it comes to tumors, since the tumor cells are very close to normal cells, uh, it's more difficult for the immune system to really detect and, and be aware that these are the uh, entities to kill uh, when it comes to cancer cells. So uh, based on the, on the theory of uh, tumor development, so normal cells progressively get malignant phenotypes through the acquisition of subsequent molecular alterations. But since this molecular alteration happened on a normal cell background, so we assume that tumor cells are very close to the normal cells, so it's difficult for the immune system to recognize tumors as a malignant entities. So uh, another concept to discuss is the immune tolerance and immune rejection. And for that, I'm going to use the example of tumor mic of, of a, a gut microbiota. So we have a, a bunch of bacteria in our gut uh, per normal basis. So we have more bacteria in the gut than the entire cells that form the, bo the human body. And these bacteria are perfectly tolerated uh, on regular basis. However, when these bacteria translocate and get into the blood torrent, they are immediately eliminated by the immune system uh, because uh, it's dangerous for the body and we can get into a septic shock uh, situation very, very left threatening. Failure for this immune tolerance can lead to a very, very bad uh, and aggressive disease like the Crohn disease. You see on the right hand figure, a uh, uh, bowel with Crohn disease with a bunch of inflammation with a very severe ulcers compared to a normal colon that you see here. This is because the immune system fails to uh, tolerate the gut microbiota, the gut bacteria, and the immune system attack this bacteria causing very severe Crohn injury. Another example of failing of immune tolerance could be absorption of a, a graft a organ a rejection. So when during a pregnancy process, uh, the, the embryo cells are so different from the mother cells than a, a transplanted organ cells from the uh, 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 host body. So uh, the specific circumstances happen during pregnancy allows the mother to tolerate the embryo development while this is not happen after a transplantation. So uh, this is also an example of what is immune tolerance and what is immune rejection. So how do these concepts uh, uh, have an impact in tumor evolution, in tumor progression, or in tumor immune surveillance? So during the progressive uh, tumor uh, uh, evolution, the tumor phenotype becomes more and more and more complex, becomes more and more and more malignant. So the tumor during this process learn how to uh, get uh, progressively uh, uh, undetectable by the, by the immune system. So there are different phases on the relationship between a, a tumor in development uh, with the immune system. So the first phase that happens during the initial phases of tumor development is what we call the phase of tumor elimination, where the immune system is very, very able to detect the tumor and eliminate the different tumor clones. If this does not happen properly, then uh, the tumor during the progression at key, at acquires the ability to get uh, to escape from this immune surveillance and then it reaches a phase called equilibrium phase where the where the amount of tumor elimination is equal to the amount of tumor progression so there is no a tumor growth there is a an stabilization under the control of the immune system a partial control of the immune system and then finally in a very established tumor in a very progressed tumors there's the phase of immune escape where the tumor is totally totally uh, um, resistant to the immune surveillance and can progress without any control of the immune system. So this relationship is called, received the name of immunity eating of tumors, and it's happening during the entire phases of the tumor. So even in a very, very advanced tumors, in a very established tumors, there are some tumor clones that are uh, eliminated continuously by the immune system because they are immune reactive. And there are other tumor, tumor clones, cellular clones that are resistant to the immune surveillance and they can survive under the immune surveillance. So we say that the immune system is continuously editing the tumor like these formations in the desert that you see on the right hand figure that are continuously uh, uh, model, modeled, modeled under the continuous erosion, erosion of, of time. 
So this is what happened in the immune system. And in cancer immunotherapy, what we want is go setting back this uh, uh, immune escaping phase to an initial phase of uh, immune, immune uh, surveillance. So after this introduction, uh, let's see which are the mechanisms uh, of a cancer immune surveillance that uh, uh, can be uh, exerted by the immune system. So first of all, uh, let's talk about what is uh, tumor immune reactivity. So as discussed initially before, um, tumors are, are a little bit different from normal cells. So tumor cells are characterized by the acquisition of different genetic alterations that lead to aberrant proteins. And these aberrant proteins are the ones that cause this tumor phenotype where the tumor cells progress under without any, any control of the cell biology and develop metastasis and grow uh, uh, in the metastatic sites, compromising the organ function. So these aberrant proteins which are, that are different from the normal proteins can be detected by the immune system as an alien structures. And this is what is based the immune reactivity of tumors. And this is what we need to, um, to uh, uh, unleash an immune response against a tumor. So how the immune system fights cancer? So there are different kinds of immune response. We have innate immunity and we have adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is the immunity we have against the most common pathogens. So we have this immunity from, until, uh, from the time we were born because evolution doted us with this kind of immune response and this immune response classically is against the most common pathogens. So we have been exposed during human evolution so frequently to these pathogens that our immune system came from the very beginning with an ability to react against pathogens we have without the necessity of being, having been exposed beforehand. But on the other hand, we have the adaptive immunity, which is the real immunity we have, the, the main immunity we have against tumors. And this is an immunity that uh, needs a pre-exposition to the antigen. Adaptive immunity is, for example, what we look for in this coronavirus time, that for being immune against coronavirus, you need to, be, to have been exposed to the virus before to develop a specific immune response against the virus. So this is also what we need uh, when it comes to tumor immunity. So we need an adaptive immune response. Inside the adaptive immune response, we have two types of immune response. We have a numeral immune response, mainly based on antibodies. This is not very important for cancer immunotherapy. It is important for cancer therapy, but not for an, an anti-tumor immune response. And we have a cell-mediated immunity mainly happen through lymphocyte activation and lymphocyte recognition of tumor cells. And this is going to be the main anti-cancer immune response. So the adaptive cell-mediated immunity are, are conducted by lymphocyte activation. And we are going to talk about this immune response during the rest of the talk. So how these adaptive cellular immune response work when it comes to tumor uh, immune surveillance. So here you have depicted the main steps in this uh, immune response. So everything starts with the release of cancer specific antigens, the release of these specific cancer proteins that had appeared in tumor cells are uh, uh, derived from genetic alterations. These proteins are going to be detected by immune cells as something strange. They are going to be captured by professional cells of antigen presentation, in this case, antigen presenting cells these proteins are gonna be taken by these cells. I'm going to be presented to the lymphocytes that are waiting for stimulation on the lymph nodes near the tumor site. So antigen presenting cells are gonna present these structures, these foreign proteins to the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are going to recognize these structures, are going to take to get activated after recognition of these specific structures and are going to leave the lymph node and going are going to traffic through the blood torrent the entire body until they will get to the tumor site, will infiltrate the tumor, will scrutinize the tumor cells looking for these alien structures and are going to kill those cells having these alien structures, eliminating thereby the tumor. This a specific tumor cell killing that, uh, that happen after a T cell activation will release more antigens that in turn will reactivate the cycle and will 
will eliminate the tumor finally. This is what we pursue when we what we pursue when we when it comes to cancer immunotherapy. However, as you see here, this effort is very, very, very complicated endeavor because in this adaptive cell mediated immune response, evolutionarily what prevails is immune tolerability over immune hyperactivity. This is because if we unleash a very intense immune response against a given antigen that could be tumor antigen or could be a virus, then this very, very aggressive immune response can produce a, a severe immune activation and can kill the patient. So evolution, how dotted the immune system with many, many mechanisms of self-regulation or self-control. And these mechanisms of self-regulation and self-control that, as you see in the slide, prevail over the mechanisms of uh, immune activation. So you see in red, there are the mechanisms of control of immune response, of autoregulation of immune response, and in green, there are the mechanisms of immune activation. You see more red than green. This is because immune system prefers to not overreact rather than react. And these many mechanisms of uh, self-regulation that had this kind of immune response are the ones that the tumors use to escape from the immune system. So let's go to see this immune response cycle step by step. So as said, everything starts when the tumor cells release tumor antigens. You see here on the left hand uh, figure, how this, the tumor cells release tumor antigens that you see in green. These tumor antigens are captured and interiorized, internalized by antigen presenting cells here in the slide as the dendritic cells and are expressed, as you see on the right-hand figure, the antigens are captured, are degraded inside the dendritic cells and are presented on the dendritic cell membrane coupled with a MHC class two construct. MHC class two are specific structures used by the antigen presenting cells to present a specific antigens captured on the microenvironment to present these antigens captured in the microenvironment to the lymph nodes. So once an antigen presenting cell has captured a tumor specific antigen, had processed this antigen, and now it is expressed on the dendritic cell membrane, the dendritic cell start expressing chemotactic receptors on its membrane that lead the migration of this dendritic cell from the tumor microenvironment to the closer lymph node. Once in the closure lymph node, the antigen presenting cell will start to present in this major histocompatibility to complex, the intake tumor antigen to the different lymphocytes that are resting in the lymph node waiting for activation. Once the antigen presenting cell will find a complementary T cell with a complementary T cell receptor, with a T cell receptor specific for the antigen it has captured, then the lymphocyte will become activated and will uh, start expanding, replicating, and will leave the, the lymph node. This process, this of uh, T cell activation after antigen presentation uh, 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 from an antigen presenting cell happens, as you see on the right-hand figure, in three consecutive steps. One is the presentation on a MHC class two of the specific tumor antigen and recognition uh, by the T cell uh, on the T cell receptor of this antigen. Then once this happened, the T cell will start talking, biologically speaking, will start talking, will start a conversation with the antigen presenting cell using the, the expression of different receptors and ligands and cytokines and this process will lead to a final T cell activation and then T cell expansion and T cell trafficking towards throughout, throughout the body, finding the tumor microenvironment, finding the tumor trying to kill it. So here I want to make one clarification because there are different types of major histocompatibility complex, MHC class classes. One is MHC class two, which is the one we have been discussing so far, is the major histocompatibility complex used by antigen presenting cells to present the uh, intaken antigen 
to the lymphocytes. And the other is major histocompatibility complex class one, which is a similar structure, but this major histocompatibility complex class one is expressed by all the cells in the human body and is the uh, structure used to present the intracellular antigens to the lymphocytes. So it's like the ID card of the cells in the body used by the lymphocytes to know whether this cell has been infected by a virus or is a tumor cell. So it's the structure used by the lymphocytes to recognize when a cell is ill and where they need to kill this specific cell. But so far we have been talking, we have been discussing the major the complex two, which is the professional presentation antigen structure for professional antigen presenting cells. Here you see what we have been discussing. So once an antigen presenting cell, uh, uh, endophagocytes, an extracellular antigen, it is processed and presented in the major complex, complex two to the CD40 cells and they activate it. And the other thing, the major histocompatibility complex class one happens in all the cells and the, all the cells present intracellular proteins to the CD80 lymphocytes just to be uh, under the control of the immune system. We will see this uh, later on. So <clears throat> this is how this conversation between the antigen presenting cell and the CD80 cell happen. Here you see the figure on the, on the left. Here you see an antigen presenting cell and presenting a tumor antigen. And here you see a lymphocyte that is interacting with this antigen presenting cell. And all these three or four discussed uh, steps are taking place at the same time here. So the antigen presenting cell is presenting the antigen, that the lymphocyte is recognizing the antigen. Then it starts this conversation of receptors and ligands that activate or inhibit both cells, APC and T cell, with what we call signal two. And then finally, uh, uh, the cell will get activated on what we call signal three after secretion of different uh, cell cytokines. So this is what happened uh, more in detail in this conversation we are saying. So once a specific lymphocyte recognized the antigen presented by the antigen presenting cell, the lymphocyte and the antigen presenting cell start to express in the cell membrane different receptors and ligands in both cells. And these receptors could have either activating or inhibiting properties. Depending on the final outcome of this interaction, if they are more activating receptors than inhib inhibitory receptors, or if they are more inhibitory receptors than activating receptors, the lymphocyte will finally become activated or will die through apoptosis. This is a mechanism of immune tolerability. So sometimes when an antigen presenting cell presents an antigen to a lymphocyte, this does not result on a lymphocyte activation, but it results on a lymphocyte inhibition. And this is a mechanism for tolerate some antigen that we need to tolerate. And it all depends on the level of pre-activation of, of the antigen presenting cell. And all these activating and inhibitory receptors and ligands is what we call immune checkpoints. And they are very important on cancer immunotherapy as we will see later on during the talk. So after this conversation that happens on, on signal one, which is the antigen presentation and antigen recognition of the lymphocyte, signal two, this cross-talking between these immune checkpoints, and signal three, the cross-talking between cytokines expressed by the two cells, then this could result on lymphocyte activation or lymphocyte death. What we need in cancer immunotherapy is lymphocyte activation. And our therapeutic efforts are uh, pursue to have a positive outcome of this cellular interaction that ends up on a lymphocyte activation. So if the lymphocyte become activated after this cellular interaction, it will leave the lymph node, will go to the circu circulating blood, will travel throughout the entire body, finding the inflammatory setting where the antigen he reacts against is present. So as you see here on the right hand figure, the lymphocyte will exit the lymph node, will get into the circulation, will traffic the blood vessels until it gets to the tumor microenvironment and will eliminate the tumor. Very important. 
very important for this process is the maintenance of a, of a healthy endothelia on the blood vessels because following the inflammation the uh, endothelia will express certain molecules that will serve to the lymphocytes to abandon the circulating blood and infiltrate the tumor microenvironment. This is very important because in tumors, one of the main features of tumors is that we don't have healthy blood vessels. We have tumoral blood vessels which lack cell endothelia. And without this cell endothelia, lymphocytes cannot abandon the circulating blood and cannot get into the tumors. And that's very, very important too. So once we have the lymphocyte finally in the tumor microenvironment, the lymphocyte will start to cross talk with all the tumor cells that he finds on the tumor microenvironment, looking for those cells expressing the reactive T uh, tumor antigen on the major stochopatibility complex class one. Once the lymphocyte will find a tumor cell that express this tumor antigen against the lymphocyte is reactive. We'll find, we'll find this antigen presented in the metropolitan complex class one. It will bind this tumor cell and will selectively kill the tumor cell, will eliminate this tumor cell. And here on the right hand figure, you see how this process happened. Here you see a lymphocyte that secretes these green cell nodules that are granzyme cell nodules. These are very toxic for the tumor cells. So the lymphocyte perforates the tumor cell and inoculates these toxic nodules to the tumor cell, killing thereby uh, forever the, 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 in the, the tumor cell. So this is how the specific uh, 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 adaptive uh, cell-mediated immunity happens. This is the main response of the immune system against the tumor, but we have another minoritary response, very important also for uh, uh, tumor immune surveillance, and uh, is the uh, innate immunity, cellular innate immunity conducted by a specific types of cells called natural killer, as you see out of here. So we have two main responses. The main one is the cell-mediated adaptive but we have a secondary one, minority, which is uh, uh, innate cell mediated conducted by natural killers. And these cells are very important because natural killers are cells specialized in killing those cells that had lost the ability to express antigens in the major stock compatibility complex class one. This is very important because as discussed so far, lymphocytes rely on the expression of tumor antigens inside a major histocompatibility complex class one to detect tumor cells as something, as, as something not non-cell. So tumors, sometimes some tumors lose the ability of express major histocompatibility complex class one on the cell membrane, try in an attempt to become invisible to lymphocytes. So when this happens, we have another group of cells, natural killers that specifically detect these tumor cells or these cells infected by viruses, because this is also very frequently used by virus to try to escape from the immune system. So natural killers detect those cells that doesn't, are not expressing major stochomatic complex on their membranes and they kill them. So natural killer response and lymphocyte response are complementary in, on when it comes to uh, uh, tumor immune surveillance. So this is the main mechanisms uh, uh, used by the immune system to uh, react against a tumor and to eliminate a tumor. Now let's going to see the main mechanisms used by tumors to escape from these immune surveillance mechanisms. So as you see on the slide, we have different types of tumors when it comes to their relationship with the immune system. So as you see on the left, we have hot tumors or inflamed tumors that are tumors that when we look them at the microscope, we see they are tremendously infiltrated by lymphocytes. Here you see the tumor cells in blue and you see the lymphocytes in green. You see how these tumors had a bunch of lymphocytes infiltrating the tumor bulb. Also, we have what we call exclude tumors. So these tumors are tumors that when we look them at the microscope, we see that the lymphocytes are concentrating on the tumor periphery, but the lymphocytes cannot get into the tumor bulb. And finally, we have the cold ignored tumors. And they are tumors that 
under a microscope, they look totally cold. So they don't have any single lymphocytes or they have very few of them infiltrating the tumor. So these three categories respond to different mechanisms of immune escaping. So when we are in front of a cold tumor or an excluded tumor or, an, or, a, or a hot tumor, what we need to do to engage an immune response against them is totally different. And it depends on the different mechanisms that prevail in every single tumor type to escape from the immune system. So again, this is the cycle of the adaptive cellular mediated anti-tumor immunity. And what happens in tumors is that tumors acquire the ability to almost block every single step of this specific immune response. And these uh, problems to mount a proficient immune response are the responsible of the tumor progression. So here is one of the causes that cause immune escaping. So the, the main thing is that vast majority of tumors have not many differences when we compare to normal cells. So here you have the different tumor types ordered from the left to the right according their mutations, the number of mutations. You see that the tumors on the right are the tumors that have more mutations. The tumors on the left are the tumors that have lower mutations. So the bottom line of this slide is that the vast majority of tumor types do not have enough mutations to be recognized by the immune system spontaneously as a non-self non structures. And just few of them, which are the ones you see on the red square, count with a sim significant number of mutations to be recognized by the immune system. This term is what we call tumor mutational burden, and it refers to the number of mutations, the median number of mutations of a tumor sample. So the more mutations, the more immune reactivity, the more chances of being recognized by the immune system, so the easier to mount an immune response against the tumor. Another, another mechanism used by tumors, besides this lack of difference with, with differences with the, with the normal cells, is that the tumor microenvironment is very, very, very immune suppressive. So inside a tumor microenvironment, there are a lot of structures, cells, substances, molecules that makes the job very, very difficult, either for lymphocytes, but also for dendritic cells, for antigen-presenting cells. We discussed how an antigen-presenting cell is able to uh, uptake a tumor-specific structure, a tumor-specific neuroantigen on the tumor microenvironment, and then take this tumor antigen and present it to the lymphocytes on the lymph node. However, for doing that in a good way, this antigen-presenting cells needs to, one, find the tumor-specific the tumor -specific antigen and being able to uh, uh, intake it and process it to be presented to the lymphocyte. And this can only happen amid certain uh, characteristics, certain conditions. One is there have to be a high number of different tumor antigens in the media to increase the chances of uh, antigen-presenting cells uh, capture. There have to be amid an inflammatory microenvironment with an appropriate context of cytokines and molecules that tell to the antigen-presenting cells that uh, these uh, uh, specific structures they have detected and captured are something harmful, are something uh, that, not, uh, 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 that is not part of the body. And this is not happening in a tumor microenvironment. Tumor microenvironments, usually they are very poor on these factors, on these substances. So it's very, very difficult. It's very unlikely that antigen presenting cells can do uh, uh, an appropriate intake of tumor antigens and get activated and take these antigens to the, to the lymph node. Another thing already mentioned is that tumor vasculature is so, so, so aberrant and it lacks of uh, the necessary cells and necessary structures and components that allow the lymphocytes that had get to the tumor microenvironment. They cannot leave the blood vessels and they cannot infiltrate the tumors because tumor vasculature is unstructured and has an scars of uh, uh, endothelial cells 
which are the cells that help the lymphocytes to leave the circulation. So even in those rare cases when the lymphocytes had been able to become activated following antigen presentation by the antigen presenting cells, had been able to leave the lymph node, had been able to traffic the entire body and find the tumor, sometimes the reaction is blocked at this step because they cannot leave the blood vessels, they cannot infiltrate the tumor and get into contact, get in touch with the, with the tumor cells. And finally, another very important thing is that in the case that the lymphocytes are able to abandon the circulation and get into the tumor microenvironment, get inside the tumor, the tumor microenvironment, as discussed for the antigen presentation, is very, very, very immune suppressive. So there are cells like tumor-associated macrophages, T regulator cells, myeloid derived suppressor cells, and there are a lot of factors like hypoxia, uh, inhibitory cytokines, very scarce of um, important nutrients for lymphocytes. So when the lymphocytes get into the tumor microenvironment, this environment really, really make the things very difficult for the lymphocyte to allow them uh, killing the, the tumor cells. And then also there is another level of protection that the tumors used against the lymphocyte attack that is the express of inhibitory, inhibitory immune checkpoints that we have discussed before. So tumor cells had a real upregulation of these inhibitory immune checkpoints that uh, makes, that what causes that when a lymphocyte try to kill a tumor cell, the lymphocyte get immediately inactivated by these molecules expressed on the membrane of tumor cells. So as you see, tumors are fortress for the immune system. They are very, very protected against an immune reaction. And what we try in cancer immunotherapy is trying to realize which is the prevailing immune protecting mechanism in every single tumor in every patient and trying to shut down this immune protecting mechanism using different therapeutic combinations. We are going to see the main of them. This is the final part of the talk. We are approaching the, the end. So first of all, let me discuss with you why immunotherapy is the hottest topic in the current cancer care. So immunotherapy, contrary to the vast majority of other therapy, therapeutic options for cancer, can really cure metastatic cancer patients. So classically, it has been accepted that the only curative intent treatments that we had on our hands were radiotherapy and surgery. And at the contrary, chemotherapy can only prolong the, the overall survival of the patients, but they cannot cure metastatic patients. This happens for the vast majority. Of course, in medicine, we always have exceptions, but this happens for the vast majority of tumor types and patients. However, from the very beginning, it was recognized that immunotherapy can really cure some metastatic patients. And this is because if we can engage this immune response already discussed, this immune response will be self-maintained, will be continuous, and the immune surveillance will take part in the whole body, which is where the immune system works in the whole body. So the tumor could could not escape from the immune surveillance. At the very beginning, I am talking about 1980s, we only had very few immunotherapy options, like you see here, mainly cytokines like interleukin-2 or interferon. And these options were active, but in a few number of subjects and a tiny number of subjects. And also they were very, very toxic. So they put the patients on the risk of death just because of the adverse events. So this made that these options through, through active in a small proportion of such as they were not broadly used because of their uh, uh, potential uh, side effects. However, recently, it appeared the modern agents for cancer immunotherapy, the two main of them are the ones you see here in this slide, anti-CTL4 monoclonal antibodies and anti-PD1 monoclonal antibodies. These, these agents are more specific when it comes to immune activation than the prior discussed cytokines. And 
thus they are more potent and they are more they are safer so they are birth events are not so dangerous so we can administer to a broad proportion of patients so these antibodies they are uh, uh, inhibitors of inhibiting immune checkpoints until ctl4 inhibit ctl4 which is an inhibitory receptor uh, that uh, is expressed by the T cells when they interact with the antigen presenting cells. So, by giving anti CTL4 monoclonal antibodies, we are helping antigen presenting cells to finally activate the lymphocyte and allow this lymphocyte to abandon the lymph node and go to the tumor microbiome. And the most important drug of modern cancer immunotherapy, which is anti-PD-1 or anti pdl one monoclonal antibodies. These are antibodies that block PDL one or PD-1. With PD-1 is a recept inhibitory receptor, is the main inhibitory receptor of the cytotoxic lymphocyte. So when a cytotoxic, cytotoxic lymphocyte get into the tumor microenvironment, recognized and a specific tumor cell that express the antigen he is reactive to, and try to attack this tumor cell, the tumors express PD-L1 and immediately shut down this lymphocyte attacking. So by blocking PD-1 or PD-L1, we are shutting down this tumor protection and we are allow the, allowing the lymphocytes to finally kill the tumor cells. Vast majority, a significant, vast majority not, but a significant proportion of tumors, they rely on this PDL1 overexpression to get protected against the immune system. This is the main Im uh, immune protective mechanism used by tumors. And by blocking PDL1, we can have dramatic responses in some tumors. You see here an helicopter view of the activity of these anti PD1, PDL1 agents in tumors. You see the different waterfall plots for response. I don't know where. You are familiarized with this kind of way to present data. But what we get here is different tumor types. You see here the names. The bars that face down, they are responses. So they are decreases on the tumor burden. The, bar, the bars that go up are progression. So the tumor grow. So you see how these agents are able to shrink the tumor volume in a significant proportion of patients in a significant number of tumor types. So the average response of these agents is between 20 to 60% of all the cancers treated with these with this agents. So this is why we say that cancer immunotherapy has changed, is a life-changing thing for many patients. Because what we know is that those patients that respond to cancer immunotherapy, most of them will maintain this response for very long periods of time. Something that that is not happening with immunotherapy, with chemotherapy or other cancer treatments. However, and as introduced before, only a minority of tumor types benefit from these current immunotherapy drugs, benefit from anti-CTL4 and anti-PD1 agents. Only those tumor types that you see on the green square are the ones that had enough number of mutations, tumor-specific mutations, so enough number of differences when compared to normal cells to be reactive to the immune system and to be responsive to these mono therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. So what we are doing right now, here you see, again, an helicopter view of the entire panorama of, molecule, of a cancer immunotherapy. Every dot is a cancer immunotherapy combination that it's being currently explored on clinical trials for different tumor indication. You see here the different tumor indication. So you see that there is a myriad of different strategies trying to uh, um, find out therapeutic combinations that will activate the immune system against the tumor. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to study specifically which is the main mechanism behind the immune scaping of every given tumor type and we are trying to develop we are trying to explore specific therapeutic combinations trying to uh, 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 overcome this uh, mechanism of immune resistance so we have different strategies we have combinations of cancer immunotherapy agents with chemotherapy or radiotherapy we have combinations of uh, uh, anti-pd1 or anti-cdl4 agents with uh, cancer vaccines 
we have combinations of anti-PD-1 and SD4 with other immune checkpoint inhibitors or activators. We have combinations of immunotherapy agents with a normal vasculature normalizing agents. We have the use of genetic modified lymphocytes, uh, trying to make them artificially reactive against the tumor. Or we have many other things that we are trying to explore to being able to make every single tumor from every single patient responsive to cancer immunotherapy. So one of the most explored strategies so far is the combination of different immune checkpoint inhibitors or immune checkpoint activators. As we have discussed before, immune checkpoints are those receptors and ligands that take part in those phases where the antigen presenting cells is trying to activate the lymphocyte or when the lymphocyte is trying to kill the tumor cell. So what we are trying to do here is try to engage the agonistic structures, just trying to overactivate the lymphocytes. And we are trying to inhibit those inhibitory structures, trying the same way to activate the lymphocyte. So what we are exploring so far is combinations of different immune checkpoint inhibitors in doublets or triplets, trying to artificially overactivate the lymphocytes that are specifically responding to the tumor, trying to set the uh, equilibria back to an immune elimination of tumors from the immune system. Another combination explored, and it's explored in many clinical trials, is trying to use classical anti-cancer agents like radiotherapy or like chemotherapy or like targeted therapies together with immune checkpoint inhibitors, trying to modify the tumor microenvironment and make the tumor microenvironment more favorable for an immune response. There are many mechanisms through which radiotherapy, chemotherapy can make tumors more responsive to immunotherapy. And finally, the final, uh, the final strategy I want to discuss with you is the using of artificial T-cell recognition strategies. And for that, we have two different strategies. One is the so-called CAR T-cell therapy. It's what you have on the right of the figure. CAR T-cells are lymphocytes extracted to the patient. So we do a leukapheresis. We extract the lymphocytes from the patient. And outside the patient, in vitro, we genetically modified these lymphocytes introducing a, a gene that codifies for a specific T-cell receptor that we know that it's reactive against the tumor of the patient. So artificially, we made patient lymphocytes to react against the tumor of the patient. This receptor is also engineered to contain all the elements necessary for the lymphocyte activation. Then once we have the patient's lymphocytes, genetically engineered, we infuse these lymphocytes to the patient and we wait that they go, do the job of eliminating the tumor. This is very active in hematologic malignancies, curing vast majority of patients that receive this therapy. However, it has its problems for the solid, when it comes to solid tumors. And on the other hand, we have T-cell engaging antibodies. These are by a specific antibodies that on one hand, they bind to a tumor antigen, whatever we decide. And on the other hand, they bind to the T-cell receptor, doing an artificial activation of the T-cell receptor without the necessity of a specific recognition of a, the tumor antigen from the lymphocyte. These are very promising strategies that are being explored and even used in normal clinical practice for some change. So this is my final slide. In conclusion, Tumor surveillance is part of the missions conducted by the immune system. However, tumors develop the ability to step from immune control due to adoption of self appearance and generating immune tolerance. Immunotherapy is the most promising field in current cancer therapy, seeks to overcome those tumor mechanisms that lead to an immune escaping and make the patient res uh, respond to, to the cancer therapy. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Argilis, for your talk. Now we'll go ahead and transition to our Q&A. You can stop sharing your screen. And the first question we'd like to ask 
is in reference to how safe is immunotherapy? If a patient has pre-existing health conditions, does that prevent the oncologist from recommending immunotherapy as a potential treatment option? Mm -hmm. Okay, so immunotherapy, immunotherapy uh, is, a, as we see, as we have seen, uh, is a very active and promising therapeutic tool. But on the other hand, if we push too much the immune system, we can have adverse events. There's an equilibria in the body, in, the, in a healthy subject, there's an equilibria between an immune tolerance and an immune uh, rejection. So if we push too much activating the immune system, we can uh, move this equilibria towards an immune rejection of normal structures. That could be an enteritis, could be a pneumonitis, could be a rash, could be a, 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 a dermatitis. This happens, and the most scary thing of immunotherapy is that these reactions can happen in every single tissue of the body. So they are very, let's say, they can be unpredictable. But on the other hand, if we are good in managing those agents, we have experience, we can really select those patients appropriate to receive immunotherapy. And we know how to manage these toxicities when they happen. We know to, we, we learn how to detect it earlier in the, in the pathogenic process so that we can have a safety therapeutic intervention and finally control them. Even we can say that immunotherapy is safe in the vast majority of cases. Okay, great. Ray and Tuzier asks, how does the immune system differentiate harmful bacteria from friendly bacteria in the microbiome? Okay, that's a super good question, and it's a matter of debate, and it's a very, very interesting topic. So there are many things that allow the immune system to have this specific, um, this specific let's say, behavior with same bacteria. One is, it depends on the region in the body they are. For example, bacteria are very well tolerated inside the bowel, but they are not tolerated in the blood. Because a bacteria in a blood, it's very, very dangerous, can be very harmful, but in the body, it's a favorable thing for us. So depending on the, depending on the region of the body the bacteria is, depending on the molecules that the bacteria are expressing on their membranes, because we know that there are different bacteria they are more pathogenic bacteria than others. The more pathogenic, they have a specific patterns of molecules on their membranes that are the molecules that allow them to be pathogenic. So the immune system is, a specific, is a specifically trained to recognize these molecular patterns and react against them. And the other is because of the context. So the, in some regions of the body, there are some players of the immune system that allows them to react against one thing or two other things. For instance, the 80% of the immune system of a healthy individual is on individual is on the bowel, taking control of these bacteria in the bowel. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Shada Hariharan asks, is it possible to deliberately infect the cancer cell with the virus so that the immune system is triggered to respond against the virus and therefore the cancer cells as well? Awesome question. Is it possible? Is more than possible? This strategy, indeed, it's being explored in different clinical trials. I uh, skip discussing this strategy for immunotherapy because I thought that perhaps was too much after all the long discussion. But yeah, some sometimes for those by those, those tumors that are not that had not enough mutations to be detected as different of non-self structures, we try to make them artificially, let's say alien, to look alien to the immune system by infecting them with viruses. Because once we have a virus inside a tumor cell, this virus will start replicating and all the, vi the viral proteins will be expressed in the tumor cells. And these viral proteins will be detected by the immune system. So it's an artificial way of making tumors look like uh, alien structures. We are doing that in combination with immune sequence inhibitors. Okay, great. Rachel Lee asks, can you knock out the expression of PD-1 with CRISPR instead? Uh, I mean, you can do it. We do this experimentally. However, it's much easier doing that using an antibody because it's, it's easier. You know that uh, using CRISPR, uh, uh, there's genetic engineering and there's a lot of limitation, limitation of doing genetic engineering in, in, in patients. So from a regulatory perspective, this is 
difficult to get this therapy approved and you need to conduct a lot of clinical trials and experiments to demonstrate that genetic engineering is safe before you can get into patient experimentation. However, antibodies are classical uh, uh, therapeutic tools that we have been using for ages and uh, we can uh, block the action, the activity of PD-1 and pd one which is the ligand, by using a simple antibody, which is preferable. Okay, great. Um, Another problem of using CRISPR is that you will knock out the expression of PD-1 in tumor cells, but also in healthy cells. And this could be even more intense than an antibody that had pharmacokinetic distribution. So you can block for a certain period of time and this could, allow, could, could lead to a high toxicity. Shreya Power acts CAR T cells and checkpoint inhibitors have been at the forefront for cancer immunology. In your opinion, what kind of therapy is next or the future, per se, for the cancer immunotherapy field? Okay, so uh, I think there's not going to be a magic bullet, okay? Because um, when you, every time you start a new study, so we saw this with molecular therapeutics uh, back in 1919 with the HER2 study, with the KIT story. So when you find a magic bullet is the first thing you, you, you find, is the, the first thing you came across and you, you, the entire field explodes after that and you, do, you conduct a lot of trials, a lot of investigation. So the magic bullet for cancer immunotherapy was anti-PD-1, pd one agents, and cpl 4 And I think for now on, we are going to have successful stories in concrete sets of patients. So that's the way to go. And that's what's going to happen according to my opinion. So CAR T cells are very good for tumors that are clonal. So all the tumor cells express a given antigen and the, the, all the tumor cells are very equal one to the other because CAR T cells can really find this antigen and can eliminate this subpopulation. But on the other hand, there are tumors that we call polyclonal. So all the tumor cells are very different one to the other. So if you infuse a CAR T cell against one population of cells, the others will resist to therapy. So CAR T cells won't work for these tumors. That's one of the problems. And the other thing is that these immune checkpoint inhibitors we are exploring right now, besides PDL1, PD1 inhibitors, and, and CDL4, are expressed on by concrete tumor types, but not by the vast majority of them. So we are going to make them respond to immunotherapy, but they're going to be few patients. Thank you. And Aviva Jelona asks Is it possible that? Some of the tumor cells can become resistant to immunotherapy and can the proliferation of these cells lead to metastatic cancer coming back? Of course, of course. I mean, immunotherapy has the advantage compared to other therapies that we can really cure some patients, but we are not curing all the patients, okay? And the patients that we are not curing could be because due to two things. One is because these patients are totally refractory to immunotherapy. So we give them immunotherapy and they never respond. They never had any benefit, okay? It's what we call primary resistant patients. Or they could be because they respond initially, but then after time, they progress. And this is because this can be due to many things. One is because we have fatigated the immune system. So the immune system, after, the immune system has evolved to conduct a very intense immune response during a certain period of time, and then it goes back to an initial equilibrium, to a resting phase. This is because the immune system has evolved to eliminate infections that are transient. And vast majority of infections, they have a period of time that it's around two weeks, which are viruses, bacteria. So immune system has evolved to, do a be to conduct a very intense immune reaction during two weeks period, and then trying to go back to a resting phase just to avoid being so aggressive with the body. So if we push too much the immune system, we are going to force the immune system going back to the resting phase earlier on, and we are not going to give chances to eliminate the tumor. So when we push so long with an immunotherapy, with an immunotherapy treatment, we are at risk of uh, causing this immune tolerance and allowing the tumors to resist the therapy. And the other thing is because we know that tumors, most of them are polyclonal, so what we get is many different cell populations. Some of them could be resistant to cancer immunotherapy. Some of them could be sensitive. 
So we are going to eliminate the sensitive, but we are going to keep the resistant. And at at certain point, the resistant will start proliferating and will make the tumor progress to the therapy. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Agilis. Um, and the last question was in reference to the, your current work and research. Um, folks have asked, like, what are your projects on now? Okay, so uh, I am a specialist in colon cancer is what I've been doing during the last 10 years. Colon cancer is a hard stuff, it's a hard setting because it's, a, it's one of the most common tumor types. Patients tend to be young, uh, around 60 years old. And uh, they progress to standard therapy. They keep a good performance status. So they are in a good condition, but you end up all the therapeutic options and you get to the point that you cannot offer anything to that patient. And that's very frustrating. It's very, very frustrating compared to other tumor types where you have more therapeutic options or the patients are, let's say, are older. So, I mean, you say they are around 80 years old and it's another thing. Uh, so... Colon cancer is also the vast majority of them. There are different subtypes. subtypes. There are some of them that respond to cancer immunotherapy, but vast majority of them, near 95%, they don't benefit from immunotherapy either. So my project is making this 95% of colon cancer tumor responsive to immunotherapy, use, trying to design specific drugs uh, that are specific uh, for uh, 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 overcome the the concrete immune mechanisms of escaping uh, in colon cancer tumors. That's my project. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Agilis. This is um, very informative, and um, we do appreciate your time. Before we end, I would like to remind you all, I'll just share my screen. So next week, we have three seminars. The first will, will be with Dr. Zamarin. Then we'll also have um, Dr. Bayan and lastly, um, Dr. Sanchez Vega. Um, again, we thank you all for joining and we look forward to you, seeing you all next week. Have a good one.